Matthew chapter number 22, verses 35 through 40. Matthew 22, actually we're going to do 34 through 40. If you're there, say amen. amen. The Bible says, But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, it is an honor and a privilege to be in your house this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for those that have made an effort to come this way. And Father, we pray for those that couldn't be here today. God, we just thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And Father, we just ask you, Lord, that you would continue to dwell in this place. Father, open up our, uh, our hearts this morning. Father, may we open up our minds and our ears, Father, and our eyes. Lord, may we listen to what you would have to say unto us. And Father, may we take this and apply it to our everyday life. Father, it is imperative today, Father, that uh, uh, this generation, the generation that is living today, Father, that we take a bold stand for you, Father, and that we do love you with all of our heart, Father, and with all of our soul and with all of our mind, all of our being. Father, forgive us of our sins. Lead God and direct our paths, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to preach uh, this morning for just a few minutes. I want, to, I, want to think, I want you to think on this thought. It's all or it's nothing. It's all or it's nothing. And what we're talking about here in Matthew uh, chapter number 22, I began to think about how amazing it is today, about how much we are willing to give unto this world, but how little we're willing to give unto God. You know, as you sit back and you look back at things, you see that man is willing to do everything to get gain. Man is willing to do everything to get notoriety, to get publicity, to be popular, to have the best, the best of things. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we ought to be doing today is we ought to be living a life that is found pleasing unto a holy God. Amen? Amen. Uh, that's our purpose. And so as we look at this today... You see, the Sadducees had already been to Jesus, and Jesus kind of put them in their place regarding the resurrection. You see, Jesus told them, he said, hey, listen, he said, the resurrection is for the living. He said, you got it all wrong. He said, you, th you think the resurrection's for the dead. He said, the resurrection is about the living. And now when the Pharisees heard this, they decided, they gathered in the little group there, and they decided, hmm, well, we need to stump this man. We need to go up to Jesus and we need to, you know, we need to try to find a fault in him. We need to try to find something that he's saying that is wrong. And so it says there in verse number, uh, or it says there in, in, uh, in verse number uh, 34, it says that the Pharisees got together in verse 35. It says that they, uh, they sent a lawyer. And so as you think about this for just a moment, this lawyer would have been a, a, an expert of the Old Testament law, okay? This would have been the smartest of the smarts. This would have been the person that would be teaching theology today in our seminaries. That, that's, how, uh, that's how knowledgeable that this person would have been concerning the law and concerning everything that they were teaching there in, in the temple, in the synagogues. And so he had came unto Jesus and he was trying to stump Jesus when he asked him, he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And we're going to read about that just a little bit further here in just a minute. But I begin to think, how many people have tried to outsmart Jesus? I mean, just think about that. Herod tried to outsmart Jesus when Jesus was a baby. You think about Satan. Satan tried to outsmart Jesus by giving Jesus what was already rightfully his. Well, it goes on, the scribes and the Pharisees tried to outsmart him concerning the law, which he already knew, and he left them speechless. And then the Romans tried to outsmart him by putting him on the cross, but he arose. And, and, and now men try to take the credit for everything that's accomplished here on this earth, but he will never be outsmarted. 
You see, man will never outsmart God. God is the creator. He is the sustainer. He is the provider. He is the almighty. There is nobody that is greater than the living God. But what it boils down to today is the fact of this. People just do not want to dedicate their lives unto a holy God. They're willing to give them a little. They're willing to give God a little. You know, like just a few hours a week, but... Uh, uh, they're they're living to get, willing to give Him what's convenient unto them. And they're willing to praise Him on such things like Facebook and all this social media. And they're, 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 they're willing to get into small discussions and small debates here in this world. But when it comes to a relationship with Jesus, these people are lacking. They're lacking in a relationship with the Lord. You see, church, God this morning... He either wants all or he wants nothing. And let me tell you, he wants our all. He wants every bit of our all. We've talked about over there in the book of Revelation being, he said, be hot or be cold. He said, do not be lukewarm. He said, I will spew you out of my mouth. We talked about it over there in the book of Luke when he said, uh, no man having uh, taken forth the plow. You know, the man that takes forth, uh, takes the, the hand of the plow to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. But anything short is well best of what Jesus did for us. Would you agree with that this morning? Anything short of our best. So my question to you today is this. What are you giving God? Is He getting your best? And if not, what is hindering you this morning from giving God your best. And so as we get in the Scripture, the Scripture on the great commandment, I think about this. Number one this morning, I thought about the commandments are specific. You see, the commandments that Jesus has given the Pharisees here, they are specific commandments. The Pharisees were trying to get Jesus to interpret the law by asking Him which commandment was the greatest in the law. And you have to remember that uh, uh, there were over 600 laws. And, and, and so they're, they're going down through there. They're trying, to, they're trying to catch Jesus in a little bit of a riff here because if Jesus says this is greater, then they're going to say, but what about this? And if he says this, or you know, then they're going to come to him and say, what about this? But Jesus goes on to tell them the following, which leaves them speechless. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. He said, this is the first and great commandment, and the second is this, and it's likened to it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments... He said, hang all the law and the prophets. He said, you can take these two commandments. He said, and you can take uh, every bit of the law and every bit of, uh, of, of everything that the prophets said. He said, and everything will fall under these two commandments. Amen. And if you get in there and you read it, it's the truth. You go back to the Ten Commandments. Uh, These two commandments have everything to do to the Ten Commandments, the law that God had given unto Moses So as we think about that the commandments are uh, specific, I see the love for the Messiah. If we look in Deuteronomy, you don't have to turn, but uh, chapter number 6 and verse number 5, the Bible says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Deuteronomy chapter number 10, verse 12, And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And then Deuteronomy chapter number 30 and verse number 6 says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. We're talking about the love of the Messiah. He says, love the Lord thy God. First, what does he talk about? With all thy heart. You see, the heart is the most vital organ in the body. Amen? You cannot live without your heart beating. You're not going to live without your heart beating. It's, It's vital unto you. And so first, he says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with every single beat of your heart. 
You see, the heart of man is either softened by the love of Christ or the heart of man is hardened by the love of the world. And so this morning we're either in here and we have soft hearts with the love of Christ where God has penetrated our hearts with His love and we do love the Lord our God. Or our hearts are hardened. We've allowed, uh, we, we've allowed uh, sin to enter in. We've allowed the world to take hold of our heart. We've allowed our heart to be full of, uh, of evil, to be full of malice, to be full of hate, to be full of uh, 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 you know, uh, anger, to be full of pride, to be full of all of these things. When the, the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with every single beat of your heart. You see, because out of the heart comes love. But out of the same heart comes hate. Church, we need to abide by this commandment. We need to listen to this commandment. This commandment ought to stick in our heart. It needs to be written on the walls of our heart here in Matthew chapter number 22 and verse number 37 when he said, Love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, every bit of thine heart. And then he went on and he said, What's next? With all thy soul. You know, your soul is your most in inward being, your inmost being. Whereas your body will die one day, your soul will continue, uh, will continue on. And you begin to think about that. And you, you think that how your soul is that part of you that is either redeemed by the blood of the Lamb or it is lost to the lust of the world. And so he starts with your heart. He says, all right, you need to love me with every single bit of your heart. But then you also need to love me with all of thine soul, with every part of thine being, because with the soul, our love of Christ that, that captures our soul. You see, when Christ died on Calvary for our sins and we, and we pleaded unto him, and we, we, uh, we, on that day that you got saved and you called upon the name of the Lord and you asked Him to forgive you and you asked Him to come into your life and to be Lord of your life. And I pray that it was from that day forward that you decided to live for Him every single day of your life. It is that soul that will go on to a place called heaven. Amen. Amen. You see, that's the, that, that's the spirit that it's talking about here and allowing God's spirit to enter our spirit, to come into our heart and to and capture every bit of our being. And then he says, and with all thy mind. Well, your mind's the tricky part, amen? You see, your mind is that which is controlled by the heart. Most of the time, what comes in the heart is, is filtered through the mind. And so therefore, if we have, have hatred in our heart, it filters into our mind. And, and what comes out of our mind normally a lot of times either comes out of our actions or comes out of our mouths. And so it, we, when the Lord is telling us here, He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You see, your mind is that same tool that Satan tries to use you to trick you. To use to trick you. You see, Satan wants to get in your mind. Satan wants to get in between your ears. Satan wants to tell you that you're no good. Satan wants to tell you that you're lousy. Satan wants to tell you that you'll never make uh, anything in your life. Satan wants to bring up your past. Satan wants to bring up all the things that you've done before, all those bad things that you don't want to remember. He wants to bring it into your memory. And he wants to hit replay over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And what eventually begins to happen is that which goes through our mind begins to affect that that's in our heart. You see, it's already been affected by our heart. But then it begins to affect our being and who we are. That's why he said, love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. With all thy soul and with all thy mind. Not only do we see that the commandment here in verse 37 talks about the love of the Messiah. But he also tells us to love man. In verse number 38 or 39. And the second is likened to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How hard is that? I'm just going to go ahead and be honest with you. Last night. I didn't have much love for my neighbors. <laughs> now, I'm telling the truth. 
I told one of them this morning, I said, it was all I could do at 5 o'clock this morning when I got up to keep from going and getting the keys to that vehicle and opening up that garage and backing out right there in that cul-de-sac and just honking that horn, just holding it in and just going through people's driveways, up and down people's driveways because I had to hear fireworks all night last night. Now, I'm not against fireworks, but at some point in time, you think that, you know, it's got to stop at some point in time, right? And I woke up this morning and I thought, now, Lord, it's so funny. You placed this on my heart several, several days ago. And now here I am having to love my neighbor. Right? But we are. How hard is that to love our neighbor? Leviticus chapter number 19 verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. You see, the Lord always comes before anyone else. He already told us that when he said, love the Lord thy God, right? I mean, love, love him first. But then he went on and he said, love your neighbor. Everyone else ought to come next. You see, it, it's supposed to be God. And then everyone else and then us. But we get this thing mixed up. I mean, we get our priorities mixed up. A lot of times God comes toward the very end. A lot of times uh, uh, neighbors come toward the very end. And most of the time, self is at the forefront. And we love Chris himself. And we love, you know, Brad himself or whoever it may be. And we put our feelings and our thoughts and our emotions before anybody else. But that's not what Christ said to do. He said, love me first, and then he said, to love thy neighbor as thyself. It's difficult. It's a difficult thing to do, to love your neighbor. It's a difficult thing to love somebody when you may not like them. Now, I like all my neighbors. I don't want you to get me wrong. I do like them. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about your physical neighbor, although they are... They are a part of it. But he's talking about everybody. You see, this world is your neighbor. And you're to love them as you love yourself. That man that's on death row right now, guess what? You're supposed to love him as you love yourself. That lady that's out here that's caused so much harm to you and your family that's... that's that's destroyed every bit of your world, guess what? You're supposed to love her as you love yourself. The only way that we can love our neighbor is if we love our God first. We're never going to be able to love our neighbor as ourselves if we don't love our God first. So the Lord answers the Pharisees' questions. And he did it with a Jewish confession of faith. You see, as you, you think about the, the Shema here, which is what uh, is, is talking about the scriptures that, uh, that, that Christ referenced out of Deuteronomy chapter number 6. And he went on to, uh, you can go, in, go into Deuteronomy chapter number 11, verses 13 through 21, and Numbers chapter number 15, 37 through 41. You see, in, the, in, in, in Judaism, this is the prayer that they teach their children. From the earliest of ages. And they repeat this prayer two times a day. And so a lot of times what they would do is, is, is they'll cover their eyes. But they, they, they'd say it nice and slow. And they teach the prayer to their children. Love the Lord thy God. And you can imagine it being done in Hebrew. But this is prominent. And so when Christ referenced the law, when Christ referenced the Shema, what he was ultimately doing is shutting the Pharisees up. You see, because they had to go back and say, hmm, that's it. There's nothing else that I can say. 
So by paraphrasing these passages, the Pharisees could find no fault in the answer given by Jesus. So the first thing we talked about were the commandments that were specific. But now I want us to see this. I want us to see uh, next the command that is secluded. What are you talking about, Brother Chris? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Love thy neighbor as thyself. What, 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 what's the secluded part of the matter? You see, the hidden part of the matter here are two words. Him. He didn't just tell, him, tell you to like Him. He said to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, Amen. with all thy soul. And with all thy mind. You see, all means everything, right? I mean, that word all, that three-letter uh, three word all captures every single thing. All of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind means every bit of it. Not lacking anything. Not picking and choosing what we love. Not picking and choosing who we love. But saying, I love my God and I love Him with all of my heart. With all of my inmost being, with everything I have, I pledge to live a holy lifestyle unto Him. Be ye holy, for I am holy, is what the Bible says over in the book of Peter. Amen. Be ye holy. If you try to live that holy lifestyle, then it will be pleasing unto God. But you can't live a holy lifestyle first without loving the Lord. All means everything. And all also means every one. There in verse number 39. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When you love God with all of your being. Then you'll love everyone else with all of your being. Our neighbor like we talked about is not just the person that lives beside us. But it's meant to be every person that God created. We must not love any, everyone's sin. We must not love anyone's sin. But we do have to love them. Because Christ died for them too. And so you see that the command that was secluded here. Was that, that it said with all. With all. Now why would Christ command us to love with all. Because he gave all. Because he should be all. He should be our everything. And then we see the conclusion that is sought. What was he talking about in these verses? Well, it's pretty simple this morning when you begin to think about it. First, it's love God. Love God. When God is first, everything else will be last. When God comes first, everything else falls in line. If we begin to teach our children that God should be the first in their life, that He should come before any friend, that He should come before any boyfriend, that He should come before anybody else, that He is first, then they'll begin to see that everything else will kind of come in order. How many of us adults have had to learn that the hard way? How many of us adults have tried to do things ourselves? We've tried to get gain the, uh, the hard way. We've tried to love ourselves more than everybody else. We've tried to put our, uh, our family uh, over God. We've tried to put everyone and everything over God and above God. But God said, I will be first because I am the creator. Because I am that I. Not only the conclusion that is salt, love God, but number two, love people. You see, when we love people, they see the love of God in us. Amen. Do you know when you begin to show love unto a sinner, and don't get me wrong, we're sinners, amen? We're sinners. <clears throat> but when you begin to show love unto that person that's out there that thinks nobody loves them, that person that's out there that's living in sin, that everybody else has condemned them. That person that's out there that everybody else wants to throw stones at them. Everybody else wants to uh, blame them. Everybody else wants to be rude to them. Everybody else wants to shun them. But when you begin to show love unto them, when you begin to show them that, 
hey, you just want to talk to them. And that you just maybe want to get to know them a little bit. And they begin to see that maybe you're not like everyone else. And you begin to show them the love of Christ. You begin to show them that you're no different than they are. You're just a sinner saved by grace. And that that grace is sufficient for all. And that if we would call upon His name and ask Him to save us, believing in Him in our inmost beings, that He will do so. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That gives me a hope today. That gives me a hope today that this world can be saved. You say, preacher, I don't believe some of those people can be saved. Well, hey, guess what? I can. You know why? Because they're still breathing. They're still living. There's hope out there. You know where the hope comes from? We have a hope. And His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And He loves us. Church, we've got to show this world that the love of Christ exists in us. I'm not saying go out there and if you weren't here Wednesday night and wanted to know my stance on everything, I don't think it was recorded, but... If you want to know my stance, I'll tell you. It's probably just like you think it is. But boy, I opened up the Dalton newspaper. My wife got a Dalton newspaper this morning, and she handed me the whole uh, back page. I mean, it's a full page. And it said, we believe in God. And it went through, and it talks about the uh, Constitution, the Supreme Court. It talked about every bit of that, and the Founding Fathers, those men that, uh, that put so much blood, sweat, and tears into the foundations of this country. But we've got to love people. We don't have to agree with people. And some people are going to make us mad. But we have to love them. And then number three, the conclusion that is sought. We need to be the church. When will we learn that The love of God comes first, that we're to love Him first, and that others come before us. When we begin to do that, church, hey, listen. I saw an article with Batman and Robin, and you remember the old comic books that has the pow, the boom, the spat, you know, and all that. And somebody said that one of them, Robin, was looking at Batman And Robin said, let's go to church. And Batman's hand was like this. And you could see the marks where he just slapped Robin. And he said, we are the church. And I thought, man, that's good. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And as the song goes, and we've sang it before, we've listened to it before, if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his... His words teaching. And if we are the body, why aren't our our feet going? And why is our love not showing them there is a way? And it goes on to say, Jesus paid much too high a price for us to pick and choose who should come if we are the body of Christ. Listen to me, church. We are the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, we have a job. That job is not to just come into church. It's not to just relax on the pew. It is to show the world the love of Christ. It is to teach the world the love of Christ. And we'll never be able to do so if we don't know this word. We'll never be able to do so if we aren't getting grounded in our faith. If we aren't choosing to grow in God's word. How can you express the love of God to others? You say, well, I can just tell them. Yeah, but what if they want to know more? Can you tell them more? Can you give them more? Because as the church, that's our job. Because we are the body. Amen. Anything short of our all equates to our nothing. Listen to me, church. When God gave Christ to the world, He gave His all. He gave His all. He gave his best, the best that he had. And when Christ shed his blood on Calvary and gave his life on the cross, guess what? He gave his all. 
And if Jesus was willing to come to this old, vile, sinful world, a world full of hate, a world full of sin, a, a world full of, uh, of just uh, 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 d- despicableness, but if he was willing to come down here and give his whole life for us to live, then surely, 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 surely we can love him with all of our heart with all of our soul and with all of our mind. But the question is this morning, where do you fall in that category? Are you loving with your all? Or are you liking with your little? Are you faithful with your all? Or are you faithful with your little? Do you know what Christ meant when he said all this morning? Because he meant everything. Church, we need to make it a point to give him our all. We need to strive every single day. We've got to love this world. We've got to love him first. Are we willing to be the church that God called us to be? Or do we just want to be the people that think we're doing the right thing? Are we willing to jump out of the boat? Or are we comfortable where we're at? Are we willing to cast our nets out in the deep? Or are we going to stay in the shallow and continue to catch those little bitty brim? Let's stand to our feet and pray. Heavenly Father. Holy, I approach your